And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new. For he says, the old is better than the new. And it sounds like when he reads that, makes reference to that last scripture that is contradicting what he said about the new wine, that he says old is better than the new. Well, what he's making reference to that last verse, and I'll mention it again, is we say that, and they said it because they don't want to change. And I remember when I was an accountant, I was real young at the time. I was 24 years old and I was in a a management position and most of the people who worked for me were my mom and dad's age. They didn't like that. Who in the world is this smart aleck telling me what to do? I've been here a long time. And they changed the accounting system and I want to tell you when that happened, bah! Because the old is more comfortable. The old are used to it. I don't come and mess up my routine. And that's just human nature. And Jesus here in looking in context, what he's saying was the religious people that day, Judaism, could not embrace the teachings of Christ and the kingdom that he was introducing. You can't pour new wine into an old wineskin, Judaism. And they questioned Jesus about, you are a Sabbath breaker. You're a blasphemer. You don't fast. You don't do all these traditional religious things. And things are changing in our world. And we need to flow with the Holy Spirit, make changes where God is moving on and moving forward. Now, what we don't change is we don't change the truth of God's Word. We don't change the preaching of the gospel. We don't change the convictions of God's Word. We hold fast to the truth. And nowadays, with this postmodern thinking, they question what is truth. And they say truth is subjective. It's what I decide what is truth. And there's a lack of trust in anything of the past as far as our institutions, as far as this book, which is outdated and not relevant today. And we know that Jesus is the truth. Amen? He is the word. This is the truth. We need absolutes that we can have foundations and that we can say, okay, this is the truth, and this helps me determine what my moral compass is. This is what's right and wrong. But if you take that away, then people are saying, all sorts of crazy and bizarre things. Unfortunately, our world is not becoming pure and holy and righteous. In fact, Steve made it clear in his teaching this morning, if you love the world and the things of the world and embrace that mindset of the world where it's hedonism, pleasure, and all this, it's not, there's nothing wrong with having a good time, but that doesn't become the central focus of my life, and I indulge in all this ungodliness in the things of the world. That is at war against God. And I'm not going to embrace the world. You're not going to embrace the things of the world. And what I realize when I read this scripture I want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And for that to happen, I need constantly a refreshing and renewing work of the Holy Spirit in my heart and life. That's why I suggest the first hour of your day, you spend it with God. If you do that, then it sets the course for the rest of the day. And it's so essential that we be in tune, that we are continually letting the Spirit of God work and move in our hearts and lives. Amen? And we see as we see the Scriptures, and we have embraced change in the church. I look back to when I attended the church as a young boy in upstate New York. We had, as I mentioned, we have hymnals we sang from. And we, we didn't clap in church. Never danced in church. We haven't danced here recently. Maybe we need to have a dance party. Because I see David dancing in the Old Testament. Amen? That's biblical. Um, but we didn't uh, clap. We didn't raise our hands. I mean, what we were doing was not wrong. We just didn't do that. And then when people started doing that, we could, if we're not careful, step back. I can't believe they played a guitar in church. Drums. Ooh. And you can go down the list. You can see now that we don't have the hymnals. We have things on the screen. When we started this church, we had an overhead projector. We had cassette tapes. We changed. What are we going to do with a cassette tape? Now, what we don't change is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? I need to not be so sectarian in my thinking that I can't hear the Word of God being preached by a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a Baptist. At one time, I wouldn't listen to anyone who was not part of the Word of Faith, Spirit-filled group of people. That was wrong on my part. I needed to change if I was going to let the new wine of the Holy Spirit flow through me. And that I could hear God's voice through other pastors who maybe didn't think exactly the same way I did, but we had more in common than we didn't have. And so, you know, what we want to do, we want to change as we hear God speak to us and where we need to go, what we need to do. Amen? And so there are some things that uh, I'll mention here in my message this morning that we want to do and other things that we're not going to do that. We want to do and hear what God is saying, his voice speaking to us. Amen? It's interesting when you look here and looking at the scriptures, he talks about the wineskin. And so that's what I'm talking about. What in the world is a wineskin? Well, looking in the natural, a wineskin was made out of uh, a goat skin. And this uh, Bible I have is genuine leather. And I have some Bibles that are made out of goat skin and not cow skin. And goat skin is more expensive than some of the other leathers or skins. And, of course, what I say here in my introduction was when the new wine was poured into a goat skin, what would happen after a period of time, that wine would begin to ferment and boom! <laughs> if that was an old wine skin, it would burst. And so you had to have a new wine skin that had some elasticity to it. It would stretch. And I, I want to say, Lord, I want to be able to go with the flow. And as you work in my hearts and lives, and some of the things I thought maybe I had figured out on my eschatology 
or my so-called biblical exegesis, and I was so dogmatic, I had it down, and this is the way God's going to do it. He comes and shows me a new revelation, new understanding. So I've got to change to embrace what God is saying and doing. Amen? And so what was happening here was Judaism, based on the Old Covenant, wanted to hold on and at the same time embrace the new wine but hold on to their old way of doing things. And Jesus said, you can't go backwards. And we don't celebrate the Feast of Israel. We see the Feast of Israel or types and shadows pointing to what Jesus was going to do and fulfill. On Passover and Pentecost and the Feast of Booths, tabernacle, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You can see that. He's our Passover. The Holy Ghost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then you see the Feast of Tabernacles where God wants to come and tabernacle with us, not in the building. So why go to the Middle East and say, that's where God's going to do everything in the Middle East, in, Mount, in Jerusalem. And you can't limit God to one geographical location. I heard a a minister that I appreciate and understand and, and says a lot of things, but some things he says I disagree with. He says, the Jewish people, that's the apple of God's eye. And he was talking about not believers, but the Jewish people as an ethnic group. I said, there's only one gospel and there's only one mediator between God and man, that's Jesus Christ. And if you don't come into that new covenant relationship, you are not a child of God. And when you become a believer and follower of Jesus, that's the apple of God's eye, which is composed of Jews, Gentiles, male, female, bond, or free. Come on. Don't go back and try to put a harness on me. Don't go back and try to put an old wineskin on me. Amen? I thank God that he dwells, the Holy Ghost dwells in my heart and in my life, in your heart and life, and not in a temple on Mount Moriah where the Dome of the Rock is. And people, Christians are trying to reinvent that and go back and make that happen. God has moved on. Let's put on a new wineskin. Can you say amen? amen? So, spiritually speaking, if you follow along my notes, let me get to my notes so you'll make some sense here this morning, all right? What in the world is a new wineskin? We're already hinted on it pretty much. The wineskin today, I believe, is an individual believer. Where does the Holy Ghost reside? In brick and mortar? In a tent? Come on. You see the progression? Tent, temple. Know ye not that ye are the what? The temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen? It says, don't be filled with wine in excess. It goes from the natural he does to the spiritual. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Who's being filled with the Holy Spirit? A room, a building, a little box. Remember the Nazis were trying to get that little box? They get the power? What was that movie? Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> now listen, every generation, if you're filling in the blanks, needs a fresh move and then filling of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. We cannot fit the freedom and calling of Jesus in the old patterns and institutions. We don't want to miss the move of the Spirit, do we? And that's what's needed right now in America. That's what's needed in the world. I think back in the 1960s and 70s, 1971, as a sovereign move of God, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and did something that I was taught was not of God it was of the devil. I spoke in tongues. Oh, what? 
I spoke in tongues. I went to a seminary where that was not taught. We believed there was a little book that the president of the seminary had with those people who were charismatics, crazy fanatics. <laughs> I, I did something that, that was, I, you know, and I think they were sincere in what they were teaching at that point in time, but they just didn't have the revelation. So to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking tongues, you had to have a new wineskin. You had, you had to say, okay, I want the flowing and moving of the Holy Spirit. That's what needs to happen because it's getting darker in our nation. And things that we never would have believed are happening in the world today. I was in, uh, at a restaurant with Phil and Marcy Casterline up in New York, little town, Almond, New York. It's the only restaurant in town. And the waitress uh, heard a conversation that Phil was having with me. He says, I can't believe it, the church up in North Hornell. There's a man there who's turned himself in outward appearance as a woman who is teaching in that church. And Phil said, that's against the law of God. And the waitress said, that person's a fine person and just going based on their feelings. And I said, it doesn't matter what they feel. You cannot change your DNA. You can't. I said, that is an affront to God because God said he made male and he made female. And when they come together, comes the seed of life. And the first commandment God gave was to multiply and replenish the earth. And so what we're saying to God, I don't like what you're doing, so I could become a God unto myself. And I'm going to determine what I want to be based on my feelings. I didn't say this, but I thought, well, I feel like a dog. <laughs> you know, but I mean, you, you don't walk by feelings. Come on. Isn't it the lot? What is it, that is irrational thinking. And I mean, I wasn't trying to be ugly to the girl, but maybe a little shock treatment. Do you see what's happening in our world? What's going what's to bring about a new wineskin? Amen? We need a move of the Holy Ghost to bring a change and transformation. It's not going to happen politically. Here, a lot of people put a lot of faith in politics. I mean, you, you can turn on in the news stations and hear what they're saying and what they're doing and all the hate and the inimical words that come out of their mouth and the I mean it's it's and there's also in the last days it talks about young people and, and older people come against all authority. There's no respect for authority. And you read Romans 13 says what? All authorities of God. It's against God. Where they don't respect policemen. They don't respect people in authority in government or whatever. It, you know, I might not like everything that my senator or congressman says or does, but God's word says to me for me to pray for them. Amen? Now, here's something real careful I want to say. We must be careful not to become so relevant with the culture that we become irrelevant in embracing the presence of God. Now, I have some dear pastor friends who are trying to be relevant with the culture. And so, what they've done Instead of having, I would say, 
a worship service. It's more entertainment and a festival. There's nothing wrong with having good Christian entertainment. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. But a worship service is where you come, where Jesus comes and takes you by the hand and brings you into the presence of the Father. It's intimacy. It's not praise. Praise, praise God for that. But it's more of an intimate. And you can be intimate with God. You don't have to have the things of the world to be an an attraction and have a theater atmosphere where everything is dark, where you have lights and smoke, and you're trying to copy a part of our culture and make it like a Christian rock concert. I can't do that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just can't do that. You know where one of the most intimate relationships, and I saw the power of God move in an awesome way, was at a place that you would never have thought that God would enter into. It was back in the 1980s. I was with some other pastor friends and a whole group of others from different parts of the country, and we were protesting abortion, thrown in jail, or Fulton County Jail, and we started worshiping God. And you had Presbyterians, Nazarenes, Methodists, Catholics, Charismatics, everything you could think of, and we started worshiping God and lifting our hands to the Lord, and the Holy Ghost came four hours in a jail with no air conditioning. No lights, no smoke, no instruments, and Jesus came. I mean, that was awesome. I've been in a cold, cold place in the Ukraine where 300 people packed in the building half the size with one little wood stove in there. There are four hours, and the Holy Ghost came. Didn't have a heat. There were only two cars in the parking lot. Everyone walked there, and the snow was a foot and a half deep, and the Holy Ghost came. You don't need to think, well, we've got to do this and that in order to get people to come into our building. You know what we need in every worship service is the presence of God. And we, we... to do that, we prepare ourselves and we come and we're going to give everything we have to honor and glorify Him. That's what we need. We need the presence of God in our worship services when we go here or there, where we meet people and encounter people, that we are sensitive to the Spirit of God. I say, Lord, you know, I need to change so I can embrace your holy presence. I need to prepare myself. I need to sing the song of the Lord throughout the week. I, I, I need to say, Lord God, extend me, stretch me. Amen? Now, something interesting. Jesus is the one who sent the new wine, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So to me, the definition of the new wine is, a, is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the life of Christ. Amen? The Holy Spirit is the one who brings conviction of sin and leads us to salvation, healing, and deliverance through Jesus. You can't heal anyone. I can't save, deliver, whatever. Amen? And then in John 15, 5, one of my favorite scriptures, it tells it very clearly, without the empowering presence of God, we can do nothing. Amen? We need the Spirit of God to flow in and through us each and every day. Now, sometimes when the Spirit of God comes, it does things that are seemingly illogical and bizarre to us. I think when I was in seminary, a doctoral student, a friend of mine, is, I can't, Ron Guy, that was his name. I can use his name because you don't know who he is. He was a good Baptist preacher. And he said, you irritate me with this speaking in tongues. He says, 
It's an insult to the intellect integrity of the believer. I said, praise God, that's a good explanation. <laughs> it's illogical, irrational, it doesn't make sense. Sounds like a barbarian. That's why you need an interpretation. I said, that's what God wants to do. When the Holy Ghost comes, he will insult our intellect, our rational, theological thinking. One thing I've learned not to become so dogmatic in my theology that I can't hear God I've got to change. You've got to change. Amen? See, God's given us a mandate. And he wants us to <clears throat> be consistent. He wants us to say what we believe, what we proclaim, we live it. Are we spirit-filled believers? What we say, we need to live it. Now, I heard Ravi Zachariah say this a couple weeks ago. He says, I have little doubt that the single greatest obstacle to the impact of the gospel has not been its inability to provide answers, but the failure on our part, on our part to live it out. He's saying, it's not that we don't have the answers. Here's the way of salvation. Here's the truth of the gospel. He says, the biggest problem is Christians living it out. Uh, here's an interesting quote by this guy named Rodney Gypsy Smith, a British evangelist. He said, there are five gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the fifth one, the Christian most people will never read the first four. But they'll read the last one. I hope and pray that we're not hypocritical. I hope what we, what we are proclaiming, what we believe, what we say, that there's evidence in our life that we are a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Now, at the same time, be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. I learned sometimes that some people are not really being honest and sincere in their conversation with me, so I'm not going to cast my pearl before swine. I want to be led by the Spirit of God and speak to people who are really wanting to hear and listen. Now, when you speak to a large crowd of people, you can't discern what everyone's saying, but you're, sit, you're casting that seed out, and you pray to God that that seed will grab a hold. Just like when Brenda was referring to Wayne this morning. I went down to Emory Hospital. I remember that day. I'm driving down there to go pray for her, and the Lord speaks to me and says something to me that's not logical. Do not offend anybody. The audacity to say, Pastor Baker, to Wayne, you need Jesus. What? So I'm going down, then the Lord says, you're going down there to see Wayne, not Brenda. Now the plan, God, now listen, the plan is <laughs> to go down there to get her out of Emory to save Wayne's wallet. And the Lord says, no, you go down there and you are to confront him with the gospel. I said, well, what if that turns him off instead of him coming towards God? He's offended by me challenging his spirituality and pushing him away from God. You see, when you walk by faith, you don't have all the answers. You don't know what is going to be the response. You have to. Trust and obey, for there's no other way but to be holy in Jesus as I make up my words. <laughs> Doesn't that sound good? I'm leading worship next Sunday. Hallelujah. Change. Change is coming. Jim on. You know. <laughs> oh, dear. So, <laughs> so. 
And I get there, and I just turned to Wayne and said, I'm concerned about Brenda, but the Lord has asked me to challenge you this morning. And I spoke directly to him. He didn't resist. He was open. God got his attention when he was desperate and he was fearful of losing his wife, but more so losing his life, and he didn't even know it. And we're going to lose our spouse one day. But I pray we'll never reject God and lose our life. Amen? Now, one day, Brenda and Wayne will pass away, but because they know Jesus, they'll be together in eternity. And don't worry, you don't have to be married to Wayne in heaven. It's no giving and taking in marriage. It's just a thought. Just a thought. <laughs> But what God has prepared for us is better than what we think. Amen. Don't worry about it. He's got it. Amen. We need to obey what James recorded in his epistle. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen. Live out your life. And exemplify Jesus. Be Christ-like. Get off yourself. Die to yourself. Have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness. All those good qualities. God, help me. Amen? I'd rather have the fruit of the Spirit than the gifts of the Spirit, but I'll take both. Amen? Amen. Are we guilty of thinking the old is better than the new? See, what? remember what Jesus said? People prefer the old over the new. And the reason why is because we've gotten comfortable with the old wineskin. We, we got used to it. We got used to it. Here, one thing I pray, God, send me into the world. I'm not of the world, but send me into the world. I, I found interesting, a, a new form of evangelism I mentioned this morning, selling vegetables out front. The pastor, the baker, I mean the pastor of the church, you're out there selling. What is, that is not, you should be, that's, a, that's below you. What are you doing selling vegetables? What are you, poor, broke, dumb? <laughs> Please buy these tomatoes. You're a tie, you're a lot of, you're not about, about, about the, you, you know, I, as a pastor, God's called me to be a servant. Amen? Now, who do you think has done the most work in the garden out there? The youth or me? The youth. Right. You know, where's my help? You know, oh, poor me. You know, I loved serving an opportunity to be a blessing. Amen? And eventually, they'll catch on. It's slow. They'll catch on. Amen? And so, you, you think, well, you're doing this, but then God says, no, he put you right there, and you can't believe the conversations that I've had with people. I, I mean, and I said, I never thought about this. Never had this idea. And guess what? Camp next year, the parents and the grandparents will not pay for it. The community's paying for it. Amen. Amen. A new way. We're sucking money out of the community. <laughs> Hallelujah. One of our best tithers in the church, the cell tower, never gives me any complaints. <laughs> Faithful, consistent. Where's the money in the first day of the month? That money is there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. That's different. Amen. We're in business here. Hallelujah. Our human nature is reluctant to change. We enjoy being comfortable. So, do we need a new wineskin? Do you need a new wineskin? Are you willing to let go of the past? Of some of the ways we do things? 
Now, you heard me last Sunday say we're going to make some changes, and we are. But it's a gradual change. A big ship doesn't make a turn instantaneously like a speedboat. It takes a little bit while for it to turn. So I'm doing things covertly, (laughs) gradually. But I assure you, we will not move away from this book. Amen? We'll not move away from this book. If we do, we cease being the body of Christ. So there's a scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. God is in the process of, a transforming us unto his likeness from one level of glory unto another. So for that to happen, we got to be open to a fresh move of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You know what's going to attract people? Is they sense the presence of God, see the power and glory of Jesus. We need that in this house, the house down the road, the one down the road, across the way, here, there. Amen? If you would, please stand.